I'm joined on the show today by Don Lemon, host of The Don Lemon Show. Don, it's great to be with you. Luke, I'm so happy to be with you. Thank you so much for doing this. So we'll get into your Elon Musk interview, of course. And then for those who have been watching Don's past appearances on shows discussing that, we'll also get into some other stuff non-Musk related afterwards. But first, to contextualize this for my audience, I want to play a clip from your recent interview with Elon Musk. Take a look. So you said if they kill the company, it's them. But doesn't the buck stop with you? I mean, you're on it. I have to say, I, I, choose your question carefully. There's five minutes left. Okay, but so is this the same, question you want to ask? The same question is you said you said that they are killing the company, but you're the head of the company. The buck doesn't stop with you. I acquired X in order to preserve freedom of speech in America, the First Amendment. And I'm going to stick to that. And if that means making less money, so be it. So I have to be, listen, I, I'm just being honest, right? I'm not trying to, like, get you or anything. I was just surprised that you would blame other people for killing the company. I mean, you're the, I mean, when you say the buck stops with the president of the United States, regardless of what happens, right? So I, why would this, why would that question upset you? You seem upset by it, are you? I think you're, and I'm not trying to upset you. The way, well, you are upsetting me because the way you're phrasing questions, I think, is is not cogent. Um, it's not uh, what? Not cogent. Cogent. Yes. Go ahead. So it's interesting to see how uncomfortable, and this point has been made in past interviews that you've been in, relatively straightforward questions would make him. How dare you challenge him? Oh, my goodness. But give my audience a sense um, of what your interest was generally in doing the interview? What was your goal going into it? And then part two of the question is, what was your expectation? Was this about the expectation? I'm guessing not. Um, fill us in on that. Okay, so it's just a goal and expectation. My goal was just, Luke, to get people to learn about him. So I wanted to have very simple and straightforward questions where he could speak and people could get to learn about him. They would get to learn something about me and ultimately something about themselves. But my goal was to do what he and his management team asked me to do on the platform, which was to be me, and which was to give a different perspective, some, one that wasn't quite so right wing, that wasn't conspiracy theorist, really to balance uh, the platform and to bring a different perspective because all voices, all different backgrounds were welcome. So. Uh, in order for me to do that, I had to ask him about the about issues and things that he posted uh, on his own platform about people who have a different perspective than what is often seen on the platform or just from what he was posting about. And so in order to do that, to bring that balance, to get people to understand why he was doing it, I had to ask him about it. But it didn't seem like he wanted to be asked or challenged about those things. So that was just my goal. Go to get people to see how two people with different perspectives, different worldviews could sit down, have a conversation, hash it out, agree, disagree, shake hands at the end and move on. That was my goal. My expectation right. was that people would learn from it, that he would possibly it would make him uncomfortable because I, I, I wouldn't I would imagine that he is not often in spaces where people challenge him, ask him questions, or he hears other perspectives. So my expectation was to perhaps get him to at least uh, empathize or have some empathy or understanding, or at least just some allowance, you know, so to speak, for people to have perspectives and um, that it would be on the platform and that it would be welcome. Gotcha. And then again, some of this is rehashing things you've spoken about before. Some my audience might know, some not. Explain what sort of deal you had with X, then what happened uh, during and after this interview that changed that. What sort of deal I had with X and what happened? Okay, so... What was in the works? Yeah. So, you know, everyone thought this was an X show. It was not an X show. This show was coming about before we even had a deal with X. The Don Lemon show was going to happen. And it has been uh, our goal and uh, all along to run this show, to air this show, to stream this show in as many different venues as possible. It was already gonna run on YouTube. It's already gonna run on iHeart. It was already gonna run on Spotify. It was already gonna run on Apple Podcasts. X was just an, a distribution partner on top of those platforms and they wanted some exclusive content a couple of times a month. 
and uh, that 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 exclusive content, which was not that long, and it wasn't that many, that would run on top of the three episodes a week, and um, it would run exclusively for 24 hours, and then it was going to go everywhere else any anyways. That was it. There were incentives in there to you know to um, to get people to um, to get them uh, to um, amplify my voice on the platform to get it as, to as many people as possible and for me to try to gain more followers to bring uh, advertisers back to the platform to bring n- new audiences and people who had left uh, X back to the platform so that's what the deal was and that's it so just this morning I saw another example of what I'm about to say pop up I've seen stories pop up relating to this deal uh, like I said, just recently one about you wanting a free ride to space to do a podcast. And then, of course, the viral cyber truck one. I don't really have a whole lot of interest in discussing the substance of those stories because it seems like, and I've heard you say this in past interviews, that Musk team could be sort of trying to distract from the interview with those sorts of stories. And whatever the contract negotiations were, great. Try to get what you want to get, regardless of what it is. So first, is that what you feel like? is going on in terms of an effort to distract from the interview and then if so what part in musk's mind because when i watched it parts were embarrassing to me but from his perspective what's making them feel like this is worth panicking over well i I don't really you mean the this interview what it is worth panicking over right in their mind first of all i don't listen to you know those things uh because I, i they are a distraction from what the the real thing is here obviously it is the interview it is Elon's performance in the interview. It is an interview that they were uncomfortable about. It was an interview that caused Elon Musk, because he was so uncomfortable, to cancel the contract that we had with each other. So that, I'm not going to get into that. It is an obvious distraction, and I'm not going to go down. I'm not going to you know, lower myself to you know, go down that road. Agreed. But all you have to do is look at the interview, and you can see, you know, I would dare them Elon and his management to look at that interview, to watch the entire thing, and then tell me why this isn't exactly what you needed on your platform, or what you claimed you wanted on the platform. You can't claim that, you know, I, as they have been saying, as Elon has said, well, Don Lemon is just doing what he did on CNN here on this platform, uh, and it's not going to work. That's the reason you hired me, is because you knew my work from CNN. And there is also another former cable news anchor on your platform who is doing exactly what he did on his old uh, cable show, which was Fox, and that's Tucker Carlson. And you are not asking Tucker Carlson to change. You have not canceled any sort of agreement or contract that you had with Tucker Carlson. So that says a lot about your motivation and also about whether you really wanted what you claim you wanted for that platform. Exactly. And if you are sort of trying to get into the mind of Musk, as you were sitting in that interview and it was going along, I guess a part of my previous question was, which part do you think really prompted this sort of reaction? The panic that I feel like I'm observing from Musk's reaction. What part, if you want to use the term, was the most embarrassing from your perspective trying to speculate on this? Well, let me just say my, my goal um, and it was not to, uh, to, um, to embarrass him. My strategy in doing this, again, was to, uh, if I had any sort of goal, it was just for people to be able to get to know him. So embarrassing him was not one. This was not a gotcha interview. That was what I went into this wanting. Um, so I'm not exactly sure. Listen, the interview is an hour long, and I've been talking about it a lot. But I do think that he, um, I think he was a bit uncomfortable talking about ketamine. But I would not have brought that up unless he had brought that into the public sphere. Uh, I would not have brought that up if he wasn't so consequential and influ- influential in this world. Um, what it means to business, what it means to the economy, what it means to security clearances, and on and on and on. And um, what had been written in legitimate, credible outlets, publications about his alleged drug use, etc. So I, br- I didn't bring up anything that was in the public sphere. I did not go into his personal life. I didn't, you know, I, it w- these were just things that were in the public sphere, I wanted to, him to make, to clarify or explain. Um, so I think that he bristled a little bit on that, but then he had a good answer. His final answer about ketamine use, uh, about his depression, about trying other drugs, you know, besides SSRIs, I thought it was legitimate. 
Uh, and I even mentioned that to him that I had suffered from depression and I understood that. So that was a point of agreement there. But I think he became really uncomfortable with DEI, talking about diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, a little bit uncomfortable talking about the discrimination lawsuits, um, you know, the allegations of discrimination uh, at his Tesla plant, one of his Tesla plants. So I think that made him uncomfortable. And also when presented with facts, um, he bristled at that. And then, you know, when I said, well, studies show, he's like, oh, studies. So, you know, again, my intention was not to embarrass him. It was just yeah. to get to know him. Right. So uh, jumping away from the interview itself, give us a sense, some insight into how things are looking for you moving forward. Now you're not doing any particular deal with X, but you'll still upload there, like you said, other streaming platforms. What would you say, if any, your uh, element of change will be? What are you trying to adjust going from your previous position in a more mainstream media organization to now being on online platforms? What, what, what am I going to adjust? Well, listen, again, there was the, the financial part of the deal, which would be helpful to the, to the business and the production company of keeping the show on the air and, and that, but the show will stay on the air. Uh, the show will stay on streaming. At, at, I say on the air because that's what I'm used to saying, right? Mm -hmm. Still, you know, the same thing. Um, but it doesn't really change anything for the show, again, except for uh, the amplification, uh, the promotion that they were going to do on X, perhaps the alerts that they were going to send out saying there's a new episode of the Don Lemon show, and perhaps the adjusting of their algorithm, which they are in complete control of doing to um, so that my, my work could be seen by uh, the largest number of people but nothing really changes for the show as a matter of fact since that interview we've we've gotten more interest from more people and more distribution partners uh, and more possible sponsors and advertisers so um nothing is going to change for this show and i would urge people to subscribe uh to to go on to youtube to watch us on you know or listen to us on any of the streaming platforms and subscribe and as you know with independent media that's very important um and because that help keeps independent voices on the air and it's you know we don't have the corporate overlords so to speak um telling us what we can and cannot do yeah but and that's that's what i want to uh, get into so obviously you had a long career in what we refer to as mainstream media now you're joining us in the wild don but i want to ask a little bit about what you observed during that time uh, what do you hate most about CNN? No. Um, so first, just to preface this, a lot of people in our space like to disparage all of mainstream media as just horrible and a disaster. There are definitely issues as there are in the online space, but there's also incredible journalism going on. So I don't want to skip over that. Now that you had some time away, what would you say the advantages and disadvantage are, uh, disadvantages are of that form of media, mainstream media, big organizations? Uh, from your perspective. So I know you were joking about what do I hate about CNN. I don't hate anything about CNN. I actually love CNN. I think they're some of the most talented journalists uh, in the world, and I wish them the best. My experience, I had a great 17 years, almost 17 years at CNN, and I have no uh, regrets about it. But the disadvantages, I'll go to that first, and I'll tell you about the advantages. The disadvantage is, the disadvantage, I think, or disadvantages are, uh, I don't have a huge promotional mach machine behind me. Uh, I don't have a giant staff working on my uh, behalf. I don't have a newsroom that could gather anything for me uh, at a moment's notice. Um, but the advantages of things that I have learned is that, that you can do it on a smaller scale, that I don't necessarily have to have all of those things in order to be successful. What I need is drive to do this, uh, continue to be authentic, People want authenticity. They want great information. They want interesting subject matter. They don't want little drips and drabs and, you know, for uh, having, you know, okay, I got to go. I got to run to the commercial and moving people along. So I am, those things are, uh, that's an incentive for me. I'm really happy uh, about those things and that I can get to do exactly what I want. This is mine to do with whatever I, I want to do with it. So that's good and that can be bad uh, as well. But I like the independence. I like that I'm free. I like that I, uh, I can now, my voice can be amplified in a way that I would like it to be amplified. Um, and as I said, you know, as I have been saying, without the corporate overlords. Again, I've been in traditional, I was in tr traditional media for a long time, not just at CNN, uh, but for a long time. And I had great experiences 
I love CNN, great friends there, great colleagues, great journalists. So I wish them the very best and, you know, in any other corporate organization that I work with. But this is something that's totally different and I'm excited about it. I can't wait to, to continue. Yeah. And something you said there, I want to follow up on. So using the term corporate overlords, I think a lot of people who haven't worked in that environment have different perceptions of how much that restricts your ability to say certain things. I know it's probably different for different hosts, depending on how much they like to cross certain lines. From your experience, how much did your bosses involve themselves in sort of which things you could get into and which things you couldn't? Is that, is it super involved like some people think it is? Oh, they're deciding everything or not so much or somewhere in the middle? Well, look, I can only speak for me. Uh, and, and, and I can tell you at my previous job, there was no one ever told me what to say. And that was a good thing about CNN. What they wanted from me was accuracy um, and facts. And so that was the only really mandate. You make sure you, you're factual, um, that you get the information out there. And um, that was really it. Excuse me. And for me to be me on the air, which I think works at any organization. So, but listen, I mean, it is a business. And so there were certain things that went along with that. Like, you know, you had to get the commercial breaks in and that sort of thing. And, and, you know, I think that at any organization, they would tell you, you know, don't talk about products, don't disparage the advertisers or what have you. So, um, it, you know, th there were things that I could not do because I represented a company in any, you know, I worked for NBC for a while. I worked for even um, Fox in the beginning of my career, not Fox News, but Fox um, before there was even a Fox News. Mm. Uh, and so... You know, there are certain things that you can and cannot do or that they won't put on the air um, because maybe it's not up to the standards. Maybe the audience is not interested in it. Uh, but this is I get to do exactly what I want to do. So, um, you know, I for myself, I didn't have people really telling me what to say and not to say on the air. Um, but. They were very sensitive to criticism from the outside and. Um, you know, uh, that drives things, you know what that I'm saying? That nicely segues into the next question. Yeah. Uh, so being in the business just for the short period of time that I have been, to me, there's this asymmetrical nature of media coverage. And so mainstream, quote unquote, liberal media bends over backwards to prove they aren't liberally biased. And in so doing, try to prove to the right that, no, we're not too biased. And then they grade because of that Republicans on a curve. Uh, there, people are running stories, you know, outlets are running stories about Biden sneakers while we're observing Trump calling for the termination of the Constitution or something. It just seems like flawed priorities there. And then, for example, the Biden age conversation, I've seen more panels discussing Biden's age than I know what to do with, which seems strange given that, as you talked about, you have a limited time in all forms of media. And so that's being allocated so often to subjects like Biden's age while Trump's running an openly authoritarian and anti-democratic campaign. But a lot of people, I know it's a long question, I promise I'll get to the actual question. A lot of people don't understand that that's the threat that's posed to our democracy because it's not really being properly discussed. I think because talking too much about it, about it in the blunt way you need to to get that across is something that outlets are afraid will get them accused of being too liberal. Um, or Biden's record even, I don't feel like that's discussed enough, the legislative victories, the economic recovery, crime dropping, et cetera. Again, because, oh, if we go through those achievements, then we'll be accused of being too liberal. And so the question, I guess, to you is, as someone who spent a lot of time inside of those organizations, do you feel like, you, you mentioned outside criticism, do you feel like that fear of being accused of being biased can affect the coverage of things and make it to where there's two different standards that politicians are being held to or two different standards of coverage? Yeah. So I, I understand your question. I knew what you were trying to say, but you know, from the beginning of that, um, here's what I will say. Uh, the right, is, they are experts. They're much better than the left at um, messaging, right? Um, with uh, slogans, right? Build a wall or, you know, liberal bias or that sort of thing. Um, so they're very good at messaging. And uh, I think sometimes, you know, mainstream 
news organizations uh, or you know legacy news organizations um, they worry to, they allow themselves to be defined by their critics and by their detractors and that's not good and so I think you're right that they're it, they can try they can be overreactive and they try to overcorrect because people will say that the the mainstream media is biased or liberal when you're just presenting facts that was particularly difficult uh, during the the Trump administration because there were so many lies coming out of not only the president's mouth but the people around him and that's just fact and so by stating that they would they will define you and they used to define me as left leaning or liberal just for saying the president of the United States is lying this you know they he lied on this he did this this was wrong uh, the way he handled this was you know untraditional right from the way that a president they will take that to say see look at their liberal bias when it's just factual and i think that it, news organizations in my opinion should not be concerned with that whether they're left or right they should be concerned with the truth the truth is not left or right it is the truth and so i think that when you're in a when you're in a position meaning an administration or a subject or whatever where the truth is not on your side it is very easy the easiest way for, to um is to the easiest easiest thing that you can do is to attack the messenger right and i often think that the media falls for that so they shouldn't be worried about people attacking them on the right just state the facts and move on and that's it absolutely uh well i appreciate your time so much i wish you the absolute off the show right now what'd you say you can have a Picking me off the show right now? That's it. Gotta respect the time uh, frame. So let people know where they can find you. I'll link everything in the description below. I'll put his channel on the screen there and the Elon Musk interview uh, there at the end of the interview. Don, where can people find you? People can find me on YouTube. They can find me on Spotify. They can find me on um, iHeart. They can find me on Apple Podcasts. They can find me anywhere they get their streaming content uh, and their podcast. And I really appreciate you having me on. I'd love for you to come on sometime, and I'd love to come back. So I appreciate it.